And we're going to go ahead and start in a passage of scripture that you probably have heard multiple times, most likely out of mind, and I just want to read it to you and refresh your mind with it. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verses 1 through 7. And because I know we don't have the, uh, the screen up, I'm just give you a moment if you want to find it. Pull out your Bibles. It's always a good reason to, whether you have your electronic Bible or you have your paper Bible, Bibles are always a good thing to bring to church. Uh, the 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Suppose I speak in the languages of human beings or of angels. If I don't have love, I am only a loud gong or a noisy symbol. Suppose I have the gift of prophecy. Suppose I can understand all of the secret things of God and know everything about Him. And suppose I have enough faith to move mountains. If I don't have love, I am nothing at all. Suppose I give everything I have to poor people. And suppose I give myself over to a difficult life so I can brag. If I don't have love, I get nothing at all. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not want what belongs to others. It does not brag. It is not proud. It does not dishonor other people. It does not look out for its own interests. It does not easily become angry. It does not keep track of other people's wrongs. Love is not happy with evil, but it is full of joy when the truth is spoken. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It never gives up. This is a great passage to begin talking about love this morning. But what we see here is a lot of descriptions of what love is. And we hear this passage of scripture at weddings all the time. But that's not the proper context of what this passage of scripture is. And even as we, uh, I've seen this passage of scripture talk before where you insert your name into it. So for example, you could go to uh, verse four, Scott is patient, Scott is kind. The Scott does not want what belongs to others. Scott does not brag, Scott does not brag. And all of a sudden you start realizing like, wow, I got a long way to go. Because there's a lot of things where I'm, like, oh, I'm okay with that one, but ooh, that one, not so much. And that's a great exercise as well. But once again, that's not the proper context of this passage. You see, if we look at 1 Corinthians 13, and then we put it in connection with the chapter right before and the right after of 12 and 14, we see that chapter 12 talks about spiritual gifts. And chapter 14 talks about how to use those spiritual gifts. So what this passage is really getting at, especially in the beginning, is saying it's great if you have all these spiritual gifts, but if you're not loving people, they're totally meaningless. It's great that you can prophesy, but do you love people? It's great that you could uh, care about people or give wisdom or have musical talents or all these different things, but do you love people? And so this morning, as we, we look at this, we, I mean, it's easy for all of us to say, I could grow my, love, uh, my level of love. I don't think there's anyone in this room that would say, you know what, I love everybody. Because I guarantee you, if you make that statement, if I follow you around every moment of your day for the next week, we could find that person. It could simply be the person who's in front of you at the grocery line who is taking a little bit too long. Or the, the person in front of you at the, the drive-thru, or the person running the drive-thru is like, really, you can't speed that up a little bit? We all have moments where we say, like, I just, I want to go quicker. I want this, I want this, I want this. It's just human nature. But the beautiful thing is, as we look more and more like Jesus, then we start seeing that God is love, and if we're looking like him, then we should look less like ourselves, and there should be more love present in our life. So like I said a moment ago, this passage tells us what love does, but we're not quite yet at what love is. So I want to look back um, at two different verses. One of them is a very, very common one, and one of them I shared in communion this morning. The first verse I want to look at this morning is John 3.16. One that I'm going to assume most of you in the room are familiar with. So let me just go ahead and read it anyways. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And it would go on to say in verse 17 uh, that Jesus was sent to the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If you hear this first part again, for God so loved the world, what did he do? He gave. 
that as we look at it, and we're to look at the entire Bible, in order to have a sentence, you have to have two words. For example, the shortest sentence in the Bible is Jesus what? You have Jesus being the noun, and uh, what being the verb, his action. So if we're going to make a two-word sentence about the Bible, what would our noun be about the Bible? Jesus or, or God. And if we're going to have a verb, what would our verb about the Bible be? Gave. It would be easy to say that God loves. And a lot of people would give that answer of God loving. But here's the problem. If our two-word sentence is God loves, let's look at John 3.16 again. For God so loved the world that he had a son, that whoever believes in his son would have eternal life. There's a problem there is that that's not what the passage of Scripture says. That God loves so much, he gave. If there is no giving, it doesn't matter that there's a level of love. But God loves so much that he sacrificed and he gave. And a lot of times, we have a, a, a struggle with this because it's easy to say that we love somebody. But when you put action behind that love, that action being given, that's when we truly show, do we really love them or not? How many of you in the last week have made a statement about somebody who are like, oh, I love them so much? That like, I, I, even yesterday, I heard someone make a statement, you know what, oh, I love that guy, he's awesome. But it was just a kind of throwaway phrase almost. But God loved, so he gave. There's action behind the word. Think even at Christmas time. How many of you like giving gifts? A good amount of hands in the room. That when you think of uh, giving gifts, who do you like truly like giving gifts the most to? Is it the grandchildren? To the family members? To friends? To the people that you're close to? People that you love? Now, if you were putting yourself back in like younger your younger years, and you had a sibling that you had to give a gift to, if you didn't really love them that much at that moment, you're probably going through and you're like, what's the cheapest thing I can give that person? <laughs> and the thing is, we think that because I need to give something. I need to do something for them. But what's the bare minimum that I can do in order to feel like I did something for them, but not actually feel the hurt of having to do it? When it, in an example, we look at Christmas time with God sending Jesus down, the amount of riches that are in heaven, if you look through the book of Revelation, the pavement in heaven is gold. Our most valuable commodity here on this planet, I mean, if, if we had a pavement, if, if our parking lot was gold right now, I, I think most of us would say, hey, there's a little bit of hot gold there. Let me just kind of like, this no one's going to miss this little rock. I'm going to take it with me, I'm going to go to the bank. That when we think of heaven, all the riches, anything that you could want would be in heaven. So for God giving money, that's not a sacrifice on his part. But he gives his one and only son that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. God gives up his most valuable thing in order for us to receive what we most need. If we look now into 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 12, this is the passage I read a few moments ago during communion. It says this, Dear friends, let us love one another because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has become a child of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Here is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world. He sent him so we could receive life through him. Here is what love is. It is not that we love God. It is that he loved us and sent his son to give his life to pay for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us this much, we should also love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. His love is made complete in us. Now I'm going to read a different version of this passage. This is uh, the version, it's called the NISD version. Otherwise known as the New International Scott Version. <laughs> Before I read it, I'm not being heretical. This is not the inspired word of God right now. 
But I want you to hear me make just one slight change because we just said a moment ago, loving is giving. Hear this passage with me changing one word. Dear friends, let us give to one another because giving comes from God. Everyone who gives has become a child of God and knows God. Anyone who does not give does not know God because God is giving. Here is how God showed his giving among us. He sent his one and only son into the world. He sent him so we could receive life through him. Here is what giving is. It is not that we gave to God, it is that he gave to us and sent his son to give his life to pay for our sins. Dear friends, since God gave to us this much, we should also give to one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we give to one another, God lives in us. His giving is made complete in us. It doesn't feel like that much of a stretch, does it? That if God is love, and that God gives, the action behind the love is giving, then should we also not be individuals who give? That as we talk about neighbors and this idea of loving one another, I would love nothing more to see this place filled with people who don't know Jesus. But the only way that something like that can happen is sometimes if we allow ourselves to be made uncomfortable. That this morning, for some of you, pulling out the hymnal was a blast of the past. And like, I love this. This is great. For some of you, like I mentioned a few moments ago, you didn't know the book existed until you were told to reach down and grab this book out and flip to this page. Because you're so used to your church background being a screen that has the words on it, not a book that has the words on it. At the end of the day, here's the thing that matters, though. Are we singing worship to God, or are we singing worship that we like for ourselves? Because if your worship is based off the songs that you like, not the one you're singing the songs to, we're missing something. And the thing that we have to realize, too, is, is uh, something that I've kind of discovered about the whole St. Clair Shores area is that there's a lot of brand new young families that are moving into this area. So if we want to all of a sudden reach who our community is, this room may, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, may start looking a little bit younger. That's not a bad thing. And at the same time, if God were to bring us a room full of people who are even on the, a little bit older side of things, that's not a bad thing. We're going to minister to whoever God brings into these doors. It may change the way we worship. But here's the thing. is You, you hear two different terms in Christianity, one of them being seeker-sensitive, which basically means we're going to do anything we can to get new people in the doors because we need to have more people come in because the more people that come in, the more money that comes in, the more money that comes in, the bigger we can get, the bigger sanctuary you can build, the fancier things you can have, and it's all about come, 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 come. And then the other side, you say, you know what? We just want to love God. And we want to put God first and foremost. And we're not going to water anything down. Now here's the thing. Why can't we have both? The problem is, on one hand, you have this that we need to have a rock concert. This needs to be the biggest, fanciest, greatest thing ever. And the other side, when taken to the extreme, can say over here, we don't need any of that because we just have Jesus. And when you have Jesus, you're right. That's all you need. We need the preaching. We need the, the Word of God. We need prayer. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need worship. Those are the things we need. But for somebody who is way over here and doesn't know Jesus, and they walk into a place, and we don't make it approachable. I don't want to say inviting like we're going to water things down, but we don't even make it approachable for them to enter the doors. Will they ever enter the doors? Will they ever begin to even say, what is this, Jesus? What is this love that you're talking about? We need to find a balance, because for those of you that felt uncomfortable this morning, imagine going back in time to a, a time where you didn't know Jesus, you didn't have any relationship with Jesus, and you walked into a church that you didn't know anybody. One of the things I like about this, this church is there's multiple people that uh, are either Annie and I's family or friends that have come here, and the thing that they have said consistently is, wow, that's a loving church. And that is so encouraging for me to hear, is that people that you don't know but know us have come in and said, this is a loving church. And that's step one. Helping people come in the doors and experience God before they ever get in the, this room and hear me preach. It's, it's said that in the first 10 to 15 minutes of somebody visiting a church, 
they already know whether they're going to come back or not. And I can tell you that more than 10 to 15 minutes passed before I ever stepped on this platform. People decide whether they're going to come back to a church based off of the way they are accepted and they are felt, even before they hear a message ever preached. And so we set an environment and an atmosphere that says, are our neighbors welcome in this place? One of the ways that I know that that is a true statement for us is this past Monday night, or Monday night, Tuesday night, when we had our trunk or treat, we had so many cars lined up right along Lang Street with the trunks open up and passing out candy. We had about 100 trick-or-treaters come this uh, past Tuesday night who experienced just a little bit of Jesus' love simply by coming and trick-or-treating because this church gave candy. This church gave their time so that individuals who may or may not know Jesus could experience the love of Jesus. This is how I know that you guys are a giving church, is that youth convention happened this past weekend. There's numerous of you who, whether just directly donated or through the garage sale, whether giving things, spending your time serving, uh, or buying things, sent our students, multiple of our students didn't pay anything to go to youth convention. And almost all of them received some sort of um, uh, like support uh, donation so that it was cheaper for them to go. And they just got to go and spend two days in Lansing hearing who Jesus is and growing in their relationships with one another and with Jesus because you were willing to give. And so whether it comes to the way we do offering or the way we do worship, if things ever change, don't ever let it be an attitude that says, well, that's not the way I want to do it. Because let, let's be real here for a moment. Let's think about Jesus. Do you think it was Jesus' number one goal to say, you know what, I want to go down and die? I, I mean, I would think for me, you give me the choice, it sounds a lot really nice in heaven. But he willingly came down and died for us because he loves us so much that he gives. Here's the thing I want you guys to, to realize is that in our homes, in our, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, everywhere, we, our families, wherever we come in contact with, we have to be individuals who give. And a lot of times we can kind of, kind of come from a perspective of it's not easy to give. For some of you, giving money is easy because uh, you feel like uh, God has blessed you. It's easy to write a check and hand that check over. For some of you, it's giving could very well be your time that God is asking you to give up your time, and that takes a commitment because you don't have a lot of time. Usually you either have a lot of time or you have a lot of money, but you don't have a lot of time and money. And so what is God calling you to give? This morning I have this apple right here. And I want this apple to kind of represent what's precious to you. And if you can look at it, those of you that may be closer, you can see that this is... This is an apple. I mean, there, there's nothing to this apple. But a lot of times we look at it and say, God, you're calling me to give this apple and to put it into your hands and the trust that you are going to be able to take this apple and do something with it. But God, if I give you, this is my only apple. I don't, I don't have any more apples up here. I don't have anything else. If I give this to you, will I be able to get anything back? And so a lot of times, like the sticker here, we say, you know what, God, I'm, I'm willing to give you the whole apple. God, this sticker... This sticker is pretty awesome, isn't it, God? When in reality, God's saying, if you would just simply place this apple in my hands, I would take it, I would do something that you didn't think was possible, and then all of a sudden you start exposing the seed that's inside of the apple, the fact that I can multiply things. I can expose the seed to make you see something that all of a sudden can go and bless even more people. Because we have this attitude of saying, well, God, if I do this on my own, if, if I do this on my own, I can, I can do great things. But God says, you know what? Your little bit that you can do, I can do even greater things. I'm the creator of the universe. God doesn't need your money. This church doesn't need your money. This church needs you to be faithful to what God has called you to do. 
God needs you to be faithful to what he has called you to do. And believe it, that if we are faithful to do what God has called us to do, then God is going to accomplish more in us than we could ever accomplish on our own. You see, as soon as you start saying, you know what, God, you're calling me to to give more than I've ever given before. And we'll come back in a a couple months and we'll talk about what tithing is and these different things. But if, if God has called you to be faithful with your money, trust him. If you have trust him with your salvation and your eternity, why would you not trust him with your paycheck? Because God will consistently watch out for you, bless you, multiply you, take care of your needs. And if you sh- uh, struggle and you have difficulty, we're a church family. We're, we're going to come around you and support you. But over and over again, whenever I watch people make that commitment and say, you know what? I'm going to start tithing. I'm going to start believing that God has something even greater and something better in store for me. It's consistent that all of a sudden they see God's blessing pour out into their lives. And so often we want to hold on and say, well, this is the way I want to do it. This is the easy way to do it. This is the safe way to do it. God says, forget safe. All through the Bible, whenever we see people get out of the boat and do something that God has called them to do, greater things happen. But we have to be willing to step out of the boat like uh, Peter did when he starts walking on water. When he starts doubting, that's when he starts sinking. But even in the moment when he starts sinking, Jesus is right there to grab his hand and save him. We need to be individuals who are willing to get outside of the boat and do exactly what God has called us to do. If we are willing to put ourselves in difficult situations, why would we want to live a normal life? God has saved us from a normal life to bring us into a supernatural life where we can do incredible things for him. If the worship team would go ahead and and come on up. Jesus loved us so much that he came from heaven to die on the cross for us. When we think of our neighbors, when we think of those that we come in contact with, do we love them that much as well? Do we love them enough that we would give of our time so that we could share truth with them, invite them into our homes and have dinner with them and share what we believe? Not in a way that we would say, you're wrong unless you do this, but say simply, I love you enough that I'm going to reach out to you. Do we trust God enough that we would be able to go out there and say, you know what, God, I've never tried actually giving at any kind of great level before. Maybe that's what you're calling me to do. This morning as the, the worship team just leads us in one final song, I would even say this, is that whether you know the song they're about to sing or not, you don't need to know the words in order to worship God. Worshiping God is a lifestyle that says, I'm putting you first and foremost. Whether you know the words or not, I'm going to worship God and what we're going to do in just a moment is I'm going to bring the two of these um, offering buckets up here to the front. And as we worship, this will be your opportunity to give. Is your opportunity to say, you know what? I'm going to trust you, God, that if you're in control, that you're in charge, and that whatever you want to do in my life, I'm going to willingly serve you. I'm going to willingly follow you and believe that you've got my back. Because if he's got your eternity, he's got your forever, why aren't we trusting him with our right now? Because he can do great things. And as you allow him to do great things right now, just in a moment where you can rip an apple in half with your bare hands, this is nothing special. I learned how to do it this past week by watching a YouTube video. (laughs) And even then, like, I'm kind of disappointed in myself because I had a couple where I ripped them clean straight down the middle. Go home and get a Fuji apple on your way home, stop at Kroger, get a Fuji apple. You can in YouTube it today, you can rip an apple in half. The thing is, it's not anything special, but it's a willingness to say, you know what, God? I'm gonna allow myself to be put in a difficult situation and believe that you can do something great through me. And as that happens, all of a sudden people start seeing what you're doing. They start seeing those seeds begin to expose that as God's using you, and all of a sudden they're like, wow, how'd you do that? Well, let me tell you about my God. You want to have the opportunity to to witness and to share your faith with other people? You have to put yourself out there into a situation that's difficult. And if you're willing to do that, God's going to be able to use you in great ways. And then all of a sudden, we start telling other people about Jesus. They start coming here or even just do one-on-one conversations. Let's even get before them. You have a one-on-one conversation. 
you can be leading people to, to Christ at Starbucks. And then they'll just have a whole revival happen at Starbucks. And then imagine that all of a sudden they come here, they start getting disciples, they start meeting who Jesus is, and then they do the same thing. That 100 people very quickly can become 200 people, who can become 400 people, who can become 800 people. And then all of a sudden, St. Clair Shores, we're having revival on St. Clair Shores. Because we're willing to put ourselves out there and to give it a chance. So this morning, let's just enter into worship one more time. Uh, I'm going to bring the offering uh, buckets out, but let's just worship God this morning through our time, through our money, and through our lives.